sing with all we are and reclaim your victory. Let it rise, let praise arise. See you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. We cannot survive when we praise you. creation cry, God, we praise you. Whoa. Break down every wall We'll watch the giants fall For fear cannot survive When we praise you The God of breakthroughs on our side Forever lift him high With all creation cry God we praise you This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. For fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. The whole creation cry, God, we praise you. Break down every wall We'll watch the giants fall Fear cannot survive when we praise you The God of breakthroughs on our side Forever lift you high All creation cry, God, we praise you Give the Lord a clap offering this morning. Yeah, Let's clap it up. So, you know, in this season coming back from, from COVID and everybody trying to adjust to what life we're returning to now and what it's changed into, you know, the church has been really challenged. People have gotten comfortable staying at home. You know, regular attenders come to church once every four weeks, regular attenders, some every six, some every seven. And it's, as I've been thinking about this and studying on the church, I was very challenged this week in how we view the church. And, and the word tells us that where two or three are gathered, I'm going to read this to you out of, out of Matthew Matthew 18. This is what the Lord says. This is what Jesus says. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Prayer team, would you come down here to, your, to the front as we go back into a time of worship, please? 
So whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, Jesus says, truly I tell you, if two of you on earth agree about anything and then ask for it, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them. When we come to church, when we assemble as the people of God in the church on Sundays, it's different. It's powerful. It's supernatural. It's holy because Jesus says, where two or three of you agree and gather in my name, I am there also. So we can come every Sunday to the house of God with expectation, not wonder, will God meet me at church? No, expecting, yes, the Lord will meet you. He is here because his word tells us, he says himself, where two or three are gathered and you ask in his name, he is there also. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the healer, the provider, the all-sufficient one is here also. That is church. And that is what happens when we come and we assemble as the church. So as we go back into a time of worship, I know there's lots of needs in here. There's needs for healing. There's needs for provision. There's needs for understanding and direction. And there's praise to be given for healing and provision and given understanding and all those things. Let's do those things together. We have the prayer team here. And even if you just need to praise God for what he's doing for your healing, come down. Let's agree together because the King of Kings comes to church every Sunday to meet with his bride. Father, this morning, we just thank you, God, that your word is yea and amen. And church is not simply a function that we do. It is what we are. It is where we come to meet with you with an expectation and a promise that you say where two or three are gathered and we ask in your name, it will be bound in heaven and loosed. Father, thank you for that. Thank you for loving your bride. Thank you that we are part of your bride. Let's worship him together. Come down, get agreement, get prayer. Let's worship him. Amen.
his blood We're washed clean Now we have the victory The power of sin is broken Jesus overcame it all
confirm what Jesus says as truth in Corinthians chapter 2 Corinthians 2 chapter 1 20 for no matter how many promises God has made like the promise where two and three are gathered he is there also they are yes in Christ And so when we say amen, it is spoken to us in glory back to God. It's like we believe. When we say amen, it's like, let it be, Lord. Yes, we receive your promise because he says my promise is yes. Corinthians goes on to say, now it is God who makes both you and me stand firm in Christ. It is the Lord who makes us stand firm. We don't do it on our own. So you see, he anointed us. He set his seal of ownership on us. And he put his spirit in our hearts. It's a deposit. It's a guarantee of what's to come. It's a guarantee of what's to come. Sealed. Amen. 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 Father, this morning we say amen. Thank you for your promises. Lord, we don't just expect, we know. That's faith, bullying before we see. Thank you for all the prayers today, Lord, that you will honor. Thank you, God, that it is yes, and we say amen. Thank you, Lord, that you love us, that you have placed your ownership, your seal, your God guarantee on us. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can have a seat. Ephesians 1.1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and, and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. I must have cut my video short. Uh, we're kicking off. I did that video, so that's on me. I thought I, thought I had the whole scripture, so I guess I got to read the rest of the scriptures. Um, in verse 11, it says, In him we've obtained the inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is guar the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire the possession of it to the praise of his glory. So today we're kicking off a new series called Equipped to Thrive. And what we're going to do is we are going to take the book of Ephesians and we are going to walk through it throughout this summer. 
and we're just going to kind of pull it apart. Different people will be speaking and sharing um, what God has, has laid on their hearts. Um, but this is, a, this is an incredible book. The book of Ephesians uh, is probably the most concise, um, theologically rich book. It's probably the, one of the most important books that the Apostle Paul wrote. Um, and, and Paul packed, he, he packed a lot of instructions and directions for Christians to live by in this book. Now, many, many can make the mistake that this is a book of doctrine or even just a book of how to, how to live. Um, and and the, the, the understand when this was written, understand what was going on around there. In the, he was writing it to the people of Ephesus, the church of Ephesus, um, which is a new church in a very hostile environment, kind of like the church today. We are in a very hostile environment, a culture that, that is very hostile to the message of the Christian faith. Um, Ephesus was an incredible city. It was a port city, uh, multi-ethnic. Um, they had 50 temples in Ephesus at this time. The largest temple was the, to the goddess Artemis, um, and they were not accepting of the gospel message. They were not friendly to, to the Christians, and so... Paul, Paul is writing not just a theological doctrine statement, not just a how-to. Paul is writing to these new believers um, not only how to survive, but how to thrive in a hostile environment. And so we want to know, we want to be equipped to thrive in a hostile environment. How can we thrive? Well, we're going to walk through that over these next several weeks and get equipped. Um, the book of Ephesians starts with a concept that this, these first few verses, this, uh, verses 1 through 14 is what we're on today. Um, it starts with a concept that we can kind of find difficult to understand or grasp. It is the concept of God's choosing us. God's choosing us. Um, it, it raises some questions. If you read this and, and you, you're looking at it, it can raise some questions. Like, why does God choose some and not others? If God knows who's going to accept him, what about free will? Well, we're going to talk about that. We're going to address some of that today. But here's what I would encourage us to understand or, or look at Scripture this way. Um, look at what the Bible is actually saying. Let's look at what it actually says and, and not get caught up on some of this stuff. In Deuteronomy 29, 29, it says this. It says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. See, our goal should be to believe and obey what God has revealed to us. What is understood. Here, here's the truth for me. If I can explain everything about God, then he's not big enough. If I can explain all the mysteries of God, all the ways he operates, then he's just not big enough because I got some big problems. I am a big problem. <laughs> he wouldn't be big enough to save this guy. Paul starts right here in verse 4. He says, and we're just going to kind of get into this and pull it apart for a little bit today. He says, verse 4, even as, as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. So what he's saying is this, before the creation of the world, God knew. What did he know? Everything. Everything. There's no mystery. And, and it says be, before, before the world was created, before we were created, he set his love on us. Before you were a twinkle in your daddy's eye, he loved you. There's never been a time in eternity that God has not loved us uh, and not knew his plan towards us. Now, now I, 
I know there's, there, there's that thinking out there in some beliefs is that we were all these little souls floating around in the atmosphere and then somehow we made it to earth and da 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 when we were born. Um, no, it's not saying that we were a bunch of little souls floating around there and God goes, okay, it's your turn to go. You're going to be born here. Um, it, what it is saying that, that God, before we ever existed, before we ever came to be, he had already chosen he had already decided that he was going to love us. And I'm grateful for that because I'm not real lovable a lot of times. And, and so I'm glad that he made the decision way before he knew how unlovable I was, right? Um, God, it says he cherished you, um, that he, you are his prized creation. You know, has it ever dawned on you that nothing has ever dawned on God? No, he, he, he knew us. He knew who we were before we were you, before I was me. That's the God we serve. And that's a mystery. I get it. It's hard to understand. Some people think that this means God knew who would choose him, as if he looked down the corridors of time and said, hey, Tracy's going to choose me, so I'm going to choose him back. That's not what this verse says. He chose me way before I ever chose him. He chose to set his love on you way before you ever chose him. What it is saying is before we existed, before I ever made a decision for Jesus, God set his heart on me, his affection, his love towards you. You see, remember that in these verses 3 through 14, God is the primary driver of everything. Why did he choose me? Why did he choose you? Right? Did, did he see that I was going to make a great Christian, so he chose me? Or that I was going to make a great small group leader, a great worshiper, a greeter, a preacher? What, what was it? Nope. None of those things. Bible says that he, he chose us while we were yet his enemies. Deuteronomy 7, 7, he, he was talking to the, the chosen people, the Israelites. That's his chosen people. And what does he say to them in Deuteronomy 7, 7? He says, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all people. Right? So it's not, sometimes we get caught up that it's something we have done or not done. Maybe it's some good things we have done or bad things that we didn't do. That God chose us. That God chose to send his son to bring us back. No. It wasn't, it wasn't that. Maybe it's because I have a good heart. I'm a good person. I, 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 you know, I've heard that theology before. I, I know I'm going to go to heaven because I'm a good person. I have a good heart. You know what theology that is? That's Disney theology. That is Disney theology. That the, 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 the bad guy can be the good guy at the same time. That's Disney theology. That's not Bible theology. In Deuteronomy 9, 6, he's, again, he's talking to the Israelites. He says this, um, Know therefore that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land to possess because of your righteousness, for you are a stubborn people. How many relate? How many say you're a stubborn people? Just lift up your hand. Don't be stubborn about it. It's okay. All right? See, it is all about God setting his love on us in spite of us. That's what this is about. Verse 5 in Ephesians chapter 1, he says this, In love, he predestined us, predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. What does this mean? This is a hard, some people are like, well, if he predecided, but a predestined means that planned ahead, pre-planned. The plan was in place. You see, God from the beginning of time had a plan to redeem us. He had predestined that Jesus would come and he would redeem us through the cross. How many have ever watched the, the show The Voice? 
Have you seen the show The Voice, right? The Voice, you got three judges, their backs are to the stage. And what happens is somebody comes out and they begin to sing without the judges seeing them. And if the judge likes them, they hit the button and the chair spins around. And what does it say on the front of the chair? Anybody know? What does it say on the bottom when the judge, oh my goodness. Please go watch the voice. It says, I want you. I want you. You see, this, this idea of God predestined as, as his, as his children, is like, like God being on the voice, and before you even sang, he hit the button, and he spun around, and he says, I want you. Before he, he ever knew what you could do, he said, I want you. You see, the gospel is that God didn't choose us because we were lovely and we had it all together. The good news of the gospel is that he chose us even, he chose us even while we were scarred by sin. He chose us not because we were righteous. He chose us because he wanted to make us righteous. Verse 7, it says... In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. He predestined Christ to come to pay for our sins as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. You might be sitting there and go, well, doesn't that violate my free will? No, not at all. Not at all. The Bible says his choosing of us never goes against our will, but it's in concert with our will. You see, many times throughout Scripture, if you follow the life of Jesus, he, he, he will say to some, he will say, I chose you. I, I chose you. And to, to others, he will say, whosoever will, come follow. Because there, there's free will in our lives. In, in John 6, it says, For no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them to me, at the last day, I will raise them up. You see, um, there, there's, we don't come to God without a drawing. The, the Bible also talks about that in each person, there is a measure of faith. So God has put something in every person that, that has a hunger, has a desire. That word for draw in the Greek is hokoa. Okoa, and it carries the idea of des a desperately hungry man being drawn to food. So, so God puts in every one of us this measure of faith, that this, this, this desire for something, and when that draws us towards him, he draws near to us. We are predestined for adoption. What happens in adoption? We have several families in our church that have adopted kids. I get to baptize one today before they move to Texas this week. What happens when somebody is adopted? They take on the name of that family. They now become a beneficiary of everything in that family. I'm so glad it's not, we're not fostered in, we are adopted in. There's a difference. And, and when, we are, when you are adopted, you, you gain all that. You see, God walked in to the orphanage of our world in the situations with all its sin, our scars, our problems, our junk. And he says, I love you. I want you. I'm going to give you everything. I'm going to give you my name. I'm going to place my image on you. I'm going to give you everything. My possessions belong to you. You are now a beneficiary of the kingdom of heaven. That's what it means. Verse 11, in him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were first in, to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. You see, he adopts us before we're cleaned up. 
before we're living right. Before, before we get everything in order, before we're walking in obedience. You see, we're gonna, we're gonna baptize people today and guess what? They still got a journey to go on. They still got things they got to work out with God. They still got to, you know, it's not like you get saved and all of a sudden it's all, everything's perfect. Look around, look at the person next to you. You know, don't, don't elbow them, but you can look at them, right? Right? He adopts us. You know, if he waited for us to get our acts together, none of us would have a chance. Ephesians 1 13 through 14 ends it this way. It says, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. You see, this is, the, this is a key thing, is we're adopted when we're dirty. We're adopted when we're disobedient. We're adopted when we're messed up. We're scarred and we're full of sin. And what does he do? He says, I adopt you and now I'm going to put my stamp on you. I'm going to put the Holy Spirit in you. And this is what happens. The Holy Spirit is the one that brings about the change in our hearts. The Holy Spirit begins to work. You see, this verse says that, that the Holy Spirit is God's down payment. His guarantee that what he has started in me and in you, he will finish. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful that God didn't leave me at the point of my salvation. <laughs> and just, I've been rough. <laughs> I've been rough. But he sent his Holy Spirit. Have you ever had to make a down payment on something? You know, when you make a down payment on something, you make sure you follow through because you don't want to lose your down payment. See, God will not, he, he's not finished. He will see it through to the end. You see, we are chosen. That is a mystery. But it's the greatest, most empowering, life-giving truth in the universe. And it sets a foundation. So today, listen, it is less important to understand and figure out how it all works and more important that we embrace what it means for us. Here's, here's what it means today, these verses. I'm going to give you three quick things to equip us to thrive. Three quick things to equip us to thrive. I think we have these on the slides. Number one, assurance. Because salvation begins with God, it is accomplished by God, we can be assured of what he started he will finish. He will finish. Sometimes when I think about how much I, I, I struggle, I think about if he chose me before he saw anything in me, he's not going to give up now. But he started, he'll finish. I have an assurance. There's, you know, there's something about when we understand, we, we can be equipped to thrive in our world when we understand that, I mean, I grew, I grew up in religion. I'll just tell you, I grew up in religion. I didn't grow up in assurance. I, I grew up thinking that every time I cussed, I was going to hell. Every time I did something wrong, you know, I was going to hell. Like God had the big eraser up there. And my, I mean, he just wore through them on me. He just erased my name out of the Lamb's Book of Life like, you know, 300 times a day. You know, uh, I kept him busy. He, he's buffed because he was working on that eraser, right? That's how, that's how I was raised. I didn't, wasn't raised under this, this idea that God loved me and he chose me even before I was any good any, before I made any decision. And so when I understand that, when you understand that, that equips you with an assurance that you can live in a hostile environment. You can live in a culture that comes against everything that God tells us to believe. John 6, 37, 39 says, however, those the Father has given to me will come to me and I will never reject them. 
39, and this is the will of God, that I should not lose even one of all those he has given me, but that I should raise them up in the last day. We have an assurance. You are equipped to thrive because you know without a doubt that he chose you. He chose me. The second thing we have to equip us is we have a hope. We have assurance and we have hope. You see, we can face any trials that come our way because of this truth. Ephesians 11, 1, Ephesians 1, 11 and 12. So that we who are the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. You see, God is working all things to make us into sons and daughters who bring him praise and glory. There's hope. Even, even in the areas where you and I feel out of control, he is working. Aren't you, I, I'm so great because there's just areas in my life. Come on. We have 10 kids, seven grandkids. There's a lot of things in our lives that are out of control, out of our control. And, and I'm so glad that in the midst of them, he is still working for my good. When my kids are struggling, and they're not walking with him the way I wish they would walk with him. I have to trust. I have a hope that he is still in control, working things out for his glory. You see, God is overriding what others intended for evil, and he's working it for our good. Have you ever been in a in an art museum or a museum, and you've seen the the giant uh, tapestries? And they're, they're just, they're beautiful. It's just incredible artwork. And the, the front just looks amazing. But if you flip that thing over, what do you see? You see a chaotic mess of threads going everywhere and things going everywhere. And sometimes that's how we, when we're looking at our lives, we're, we're looking at the backside of the tapestry of our life. And it just looks chaotic. Lord, how, how is this all going to work? How is this going? To, I don't understand how this ties to this and this connects to this and that color to this color and this color to this color. What does? And then one day, God's going to flip that tapestry over and you're going to see. And we'll see the picture of our lives that he has for us. The amazing glory of his work in our lives. Romans 8, 18, yet we... Suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. So if your life feels chaotic, you feel like the tapestry, you're looking at the backside, you're going, nothing makes sense, Tracy. Let me tell you, you are equipped with hope. He's not finished with you yet. Third thing, we are equipped, we are, we are equipped with assurance, we're equipped with hope, and we are equipped with a boldness to share. We are, we are equipped to thrive in this culture that is so anti-God, anti-church. We are equipped with a boldness. Why? Because we have a assurance and we have, we have hope. And that hope, others need. And so God gives us a boldness. You say, why should we share? Why should we share Christ? Isn't, didn't he predestine? Didn't he choose everybody? Yes, he did. But Paul knew that, and yet God chose him and, and called him to share, and, and he gave him confidence to share. Why? Because, hey, if God chose people, even the people that I wouldn't choose, right? You got people around you. You wouldn't choose to be on your team. You wouldn't choose to be on your God team, right? They're messed up. They, they don't live the way they should. They've got lifestyles that are, that are opposite of what the word teaches, but yet God says, I chose. Who are you to decide who's on the team? But he gives us a boldness. No matter how hard-hearted people can be, no matter how rebellious they could be, he's given us a boldness. Paul faced it. He's writing to a church in a city that was so anti-God. They had 50 different temples to different gods. You see, God promised he will save. 
Why? Why? Why if God chooses? Well, guess what? Remember Deuteronomy 29? That's the mystery we don't understand. I don't understand it. But what is revealed is that we are to share Christ. We are to have a boldness with our faith, with the assurance and the hope. Let's obey the revealed, and that is to share. Let, let, let how God chooses people remain in the realm of the secret things that God, uh, that God has, and he understands only. And here, here's the truth about it. It can become arrogance and disobedience to sit around debating the nuances of theology when simple obedience is what is required. People ask me sometimes about scripture, and I said, well, here's my deal. I'm just trying to obey the things I do understand. And if I can get those three things down, <laughs> then I'm good. Let the mystery stay his. What is important is the assurance that God chose us before the foundation of the world. And if he chose us before the world began, he won't give up on us for any reason. He's working his good plan even in our darkest moments so that we can walk with assurance, with hope, and boldly proclaim and share the truth of who Jesus is. Matthew 5, 14, as we stand this morning. You are the light of the world, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. We are his people. Listen, there's people all around us that God sent his son to die for, who God has set his love and affection towards and they need to hear, hear that they are loved. There's hope and a purpose. We were on a Zoom call this week with several pastors from around the country. And our guest speaker was a man named Reggie, Reggie Dabbs. First heard his story, I don't know, in the late 90s. And he called himself the $20 baby. He was conceived when his mom was working the streets as a teenager. And he now goes, for 36 years, he has been going into public schools sharing his story. And we asked him, we, we said, with all this going on, he's in, he's in Dallas. And he's right there close to the shootings. They're going to have him speak at that school, the first day of school next year. And he, he shared, and he said, we asked, what do, we, what do these kids need? What are you finding in the schools? And he says, they need to hear that they're loved and that there's hope and that there's a purpose. We, we have that answer. But we get so busy here that we don't walk out with assurance and hope and share with people that God loves them, that they can have hope and that they can have a purpose. I tell you, be equipped this week with the assurance of God in your life. Be equipped this week with the hope of God in your life. Be equipped this week to be bold in your faith. Why? Because scripture says that we were all sinners and Christ died for us. The son of God, born without sin, lived a perfect life, shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sins so that whosoever calls on his name shall be saved. He chose us. Out of everything he created, he chose us. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, maybe you're here this morning and you have never heard how much God loves you and that he chose you. And today you are drawn, the, the Holy Spirit, the hakoa, the drawing is happening. The Holy Spirit is drawing you to him and you would say, yes, I want that assurance. I want that hope. I, I want that love and purpose in my life. The simple thing to do is invite Jesus in. He's already chose you. He's already believing in you. You just got to believe in him. 
And today, that, today's the day you want to invite Jesus into your life. Whether you're here in person or watching online, you can write us, let us know. But if you're here in person, I want to pray. If you just slip up your hand right now, just slip up your hand and you say, today I want to invite Jesus into my life, into my situation. All right, I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, thank you today. Lord, that your word says if we declare with our mouth that you are Lord and we believe in our heart that, that God raised you from the dead, that we shall be saved. So this morning, we declare, Heavenly Father, we know that we are sinners. We ask you to forgive us. We believe that you died for our sins and you rose from the dead. And we invite you to come into our lives as our Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen.